Hi, this is Joe Meek for the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society Cultivating Community Gardens Histories Project for the Community Garden Memory Project. Today's date is February 2nd, 2023, and I'm here on Zoom recording an interview with Michael Loferno, um, who is a founding member of Fitzwater 2000 Community Garden, um, and also a, a several decades running Philadelphia Flower Show exhibitor. Um, right? Um, yep. And so, Michael, I'd love to talk to you more about both of those things, but before we really get into um, the meat of your more recent gardening work um, and Fitzwater 3000, the flower show, etc. I want to ask a little bit more about your background, if that's okay. Um, so where did you grow up? And did you or your neighbors have gardens there? Um, I grew up in Drexel Hill uh, in the suburbs. And um, <clears throat> I uh, had woods near my house and, and uh, places to get in, get dirty and muddy uh, nearby. And um, I had a small garden <clears throat> there at my, at my house, in my backyard. Um, and um, so I guess I kind of got started by gardening from influence from my grandmother. Um, and uh, she had come from Austria-Hungary and uh, around 1900 ish and um so she brought with her kind of gardening skills and um they lived in a small town in what's now Romania but they um they grew what they could uh, for substance subsistence in their own on their own property but they were also part of the greater empire so um they they grew lots of different things and one of the things that she brought to me or to my attention was she had a wall-to-wall -wall garden in her backyard. I went around all the all the fence lines in their yard out in Manoa, and um, she had pear trees and apple trees and lots and lots of raspberries. And um, so she was growing essentially food to eat, not ornamental plants as much. But um, the whole backyard was was lined with all kinds of, uh, you know, and, and plus the traditional sort of um, vegetables and whatnot. Um, so I kind of got exposed to that, and you know, I didn't know that it was a chore when she would have my dad bring us over there to pick raspberries because there was there was quite a lot of raspberries and it was. Now that I now that I have to do it, I'm thinking, how did she ever do all that? And of course, with us being only two or three feet tall, we could easily go underneath the raspberry bushes and do all of the picking that she would have had to get down on her hands and knees to do or whatever. So it worked out. But um, and she canned a lot of things. And so I guess um, of all my uh, whatever ancestors that she would be the most influential, I guess, to, to me learning to, you know, work with the, with the dirt and also to grow things to, uh, to eat. And um, so when I started gardening at home in Drexel Hill, I was, gar you know, growing strawberries and raspberries and uh, lots of, um, you know, the basic tomato plants and peppers and stuff like that, that you would have, so. So you quickly went from picking raspberries with your siblings and your grandmother's um, garden to cultivating your own raspberries and uh, your own vegetables as well. Yeah, so when I moved into the city, um, I, uh, my first apartment, I just had a roof deck, but then my second place that I moved to, uh, we had a small, well, there was a small patch of ground behind it. And I um, had, you know, the, the landlord let me garden stuff there. But soon after that, I bought a house. <clears throat> you mentioned Stephen Machievsky. Uh, so I bought a, a property right next door to his 
and uh, in uh, Southwest Center City. And then we um, bought those properties essentially because there was so much ground behind it. My house is only 30 feet deep and my garden is 70 feet more beyond that. So you have a total of 100 feet, but it's two thirds, you know, blank space and one third house. And my house was a abandoned uh, property, uh, abandoned house, and uh, with no windows, no doors, no uh, only part of a roof. So I, I had a lot of work cut out for myself. And luckily, I was young and energetic and able to do that stuff. And so I was built, you know, rehabbing my house at the same time that I was, you know, taking over the backyard and uh and so uh, uh, and early on i was you know i had brought um plants because i had taken cuttings and stuff or plants from my grandmother's garden and um and moved them from to bainbridge street and then to fitzwater street and so i, I still have the same clonal varieties that she grew and then I've, I've since added to that a few things that I bought a few other more fancy blue or uh, raspberry cultivars but mostly what I have are are uh, the same plants that she grew god it's 50, 40 years ago now um so I you know I've been perpetuating those and have since been able to share some of those with my uh niece and nephews um so they have now we have sort of the the laferno variety of whatever it is is still per, still persisting so um and they're they're kind of uh you know they like a gravelly angry soil they don't really want a lot of care and attention so it works out well because most of the property when we bought it was covered with um, a lot of rubble, brick rubble, and they knocked the houses down nearby, just knocked them into the ground and filled them up. And at back then, they didn't have regulations about dismantling houses. So most people just dumped it into the basement or whatever. And so you had these areas filled, just filled with broken brick and rock. And I spent many, many many weeks, months, um, and I'm still finding, you know, rubble from those houses in the ground, but they, you know, the raspberries like that, so that's, that's cool, but um, aside from that, they don't require much uh, attention, and I've grown a lot of other things over the years, um, and when we first started, of course, there were no trees um, shading the property. I planted a lot of trees, and um was gifted a bunch of plants so that you know gradually i've honed my interest uh, to be primarily native plants or um plants that are particularly uh you know of culinary or herbal value so that's kind of where i've evolved I mean, not only have you maintained varieties that your grandmother has been cultivating since 1900, perhaps, um, but you've also been adding to um, Fitzwater 2000 more native plants um, and other plants with culinary value and trees, of course. Right, right. And so I guess the um, when we got started with <clears throat> Fitzwater 2000, um, in the 1990s, you know, I was happy to take pl some plants that I had in my uh, space down there and add to that uh, mix. But um, and and we were um, strangers, you know, who had come together to garden this or to uh, beautify this little vacant lot. Um, and then we 
kind of didn't know how to say no to anybody. If somebody said, oh, I have this or that, I'm like, do you want some of this? And we would say, sure, whatever, we'll take whatever. And, you know, it's, but now over time, we've been able to, um, you know, sort of get to know the plants better and remove things that are uh, aggressive or invasive and then replace them with more native, uh, native varieties. And so we've gotten a couple of grants, um, one specifically to grow a pollinator. Well, now they call them pollinator gardens. Back then we just called it a butterfly garden. And we um, you know, got a small grant from the garden, uh, garden Club of Pennsylvania to, uh, to do that. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of our focus now. Yeah, okay. So yeah, in addition to your own personal gardening, since you came to um, Fitzwater, which had been kind of, which you'd kind of carried from your earlier tenure at Bainbridge Street, which you've carried in turn from earlier growing up in Drexel Hill, you've also been working a lot in Fitzwater 2000 and uh, putting all that together um, to the state that it currently is, where it has that, what it, uh, you know, butterfly garden slash now called pollinator garden with all these trees, um, which, yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask a little bit more as well about another aspect of your background, which is um, your profession, in your professional career, you're a landscape architect, um, right? And so you've talked a little bit about, you know, moving to the city, um, and uh, as well, similar to Stephen Machayevsky, who you mentioned, I'm another co-founder of the garden. Um, you also have a very strong naturalist bent. Um, and obvious, and uh, as you mentioned with, you know, making your own garden from a very early age, um, <laughs> your background goes back a while in leading up to that land, that landscape architecture degree and landscape architecture work, um, which you obtained your degree in landscape architecture from Penn State in 1980, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Uh, so how would you characterize the relationship between your landscaping work and your work um, it, in, you know, the community garden? Um, well, I mean, to back up even further, I, you know, I'm, I'm an inveterate Boy Scout. And so I, I learned, you know, a lot about nature and the outdoors um, through, well, I was naturally drawn to it, but I kind of honed those interests through involvement with the Scouts and with um, being outdoors. And we went, we went camping once a month, 12 months out of the year in all kinds of weather. And so, you know, I learned to adapt to the to the uh, you know environment and and grew to respect um, the outdoors and and at of course uh, I was in the Scouts in the 1970s and so there was a lot of environmental activism going on and we did a lot of lot cleanups and stream cleanups and things like that as part of our service uh, activities in in the Scouts and. And I, you know, I developed a, a master plan for Delmont Scout Reservation while I was just about to graduate from uh, Penn State. And so I, I was doing that work as well and very heavily involved with the Scouts. And so that, that kind of um, strengthened my, my interest in that. And then I, I, you know, when I went to my high school guidance counselor and they, you know, they give you all these tests and whatever to decide what you're interested in. And, you know, I kept coming up as forestry and, uh, and architecture were my two major, like, you know, according to them, my two major field choices. And somehow I heard about this thing called landscape architecture, which seemed to be a little of both. And I thought, well, this sounds pretty cool. Maybe I'll check this out. And my guidance counselor didn't know the difference between Penn and Penn State. And 
was kind of at a loss with what landscape architecture was. So I just was kind of fending for myself and I ended up applying for a couple different uh, schools. And you know, like I sent it up to up at Syracuse uh, and at Virginia Tech and, and Penn State. And, um, and so obviously Penn State was nearer and, and yet far enough away from my parents to give me some independence. <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, so that worked out pretty well for me. And I, once I got there, I got to, and I, <clears throat> Penn, at Penn State, you know, it's a big school. A lot of kids from my high school would, went to Penn State, but they all went to Lima to the, to the local campus. And because of the major that I chose, I was required to go to Penn, to the main campus, which was a, a treat. Um, in disguise. So um, I, I jumped into LA from the very first semester, you know, and I, the more I got into it, the more I just, I really like was delighted to have found this particular way to combine like my artistic bent with my naturalist bent, you know, and, um, and learning more and more as I did about you know, soils and about the help about plants and uh, ornamental plants and design and all these things kind of came together for me really well. So I, I uh, was very happy and did really well there. And so when I, when I got out of school, um, uh, well, while I was still in school, I had interned at, at a local planning firm in Philadelphia. And I, really like that and I was just so eager to get out in the field and start uh, not well, not in the field but in the profession and start doing stuff start designing stuff right away and and so I didn't even consider going to a master's program with that I just went dove right into the job market and the 80s were very challenging as a job market goes there was recession after recession and all kinds of weird stuff going on so I felt my I was lucky to keep this job and I ended up staying there for 17 years which was probably too long but um I'm I'm uh I don't adapt to change quickly so it worked out you know for the most part and then um so but while there I was I was doing you know master planning and site planning for like really big projects and a lot of these projects I designed it would take you know, 10 years before they get constructed because of all the bureaucracy and the permitting and whatnot. So um, taking on little projects like little gardening or landscape design projects gave me more satisfaction or a different kind of satisfaction because I could design something one day and get it built the next day. So that was kind of cool. And so you know, I volunteered my time for different organizations and including, you know, Fitzwater 2000. I, I did a, met with all the, well, I knew all the people by then and we met together and worked out, you know, what people wanted to have in the garden. And so um, we came up with a, a, what I think is a pretty nice plan. And um, we, were able to get support through PHS uh, and the Neighborhood Gardens Association eventually to uh, make that more permanent. Yeah, one thing that leaped out to me when Stephen was talking about the garden was how well planned um, and how organically planned it kind of was, with like the circular design and with trees around that and then with you know, with like different kind of plant highlights, so like you mentioned, um, perilla um, designs at one point. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that definitely made me, that, you know, is not something every garden has or gets um, in its journey from being a vacant lot um, filled with rubble, as you said, into becoming a, a community garden. Well, yeah, and I think I mean I've taught I've since um, be become more and more and more involved with PHS over the years, and I ended up teaching a, a number of classes <clears throat> for PHS um, through uh, 
through their outreach programs. And, you know, one of a couple of the courses I've taught were, was garden tenders. And having taken the garden tenders class, which I was kind of overqualified for, but <laughs> the, anyway, I took the class to see what it was. And I ended up teaching segments of that class later on with Sally McCabe and, and her crew. And so that, you know, one of the things that I think people, one of the complaints I've heard over and over again from other uh, people across the city was that, yeah, the gardens are okay, but they look pretty miserable half the year, you know, when they're, everything's dead and there's no real, like, nothing to look at. And, and you know, it's, it's, it seems like it was almost considered an eyesore. A lot of these gardens were just covered with chain link fences around them and you know it looked like it looked like a vacant lot pretty much until things started growing and so my one of my big uh i guess ideas is that you know the garden should look good year round and and that also the garden shouldn't just be like a fence with plants inside of it but there should be a sequence to it so there's a front door you know there's a, a foyer there's meeting space and then there's the utility part of it um and so getting people uh, even other community gardens to think about the fact that you know not everybody finds dead tomato plants attractive you know the the people that walk by don't want to see that so why can't you just make the front entrance the front the front door or the front yard or foyer or whatever you want to call it that should be attractive all the time so that when people walk by they think oh there's something somebody cares about this place you know it's not just a bunch of of dead tomato plants with stakes everywhere you know and and it only takes a few feet to do that we like we lucky to have a, a fairly large front garden where we, you know, over time have used that space for, for meetings, um, but also for holiday um, things. We set up a whole uh, Halloween display for the neighborhood kids. Um, there was a time when there were no kids in our neighborhood, really, the, you know, but now that young families have moved back into the city and, and have made it their home. And so there was a need to like you know, provide that. And most of the people in our group are, if they have kids, their kids are grown. So they, they wanna sort of like still keep that connection going and, and, you know, have invite the kids in to, you know, and once, you know, I, I remember when I had my first in my own garden on Fitz, down, down the block on Fitzwater Street, I had uh, planted some some uh, melons or oh a cantaloupe. That's what it was, a cantaloupe. And uh, I, so some of the kids would come by, and it wasn't all fenced in, whatever. So they would come by, and they were like, "Oh, what's what's this? What's that?" And I would like tell them what what these things were, and these were like you know kids that were five or six years old, whatever. And I said, well, you know, that, that's a cantaloupe. And he go, and the kid said, oh, you better, you better take that inside. And I was like, no, uh, it's going to get bigger. And he said, bigger? And his eyes got really wide. And I said, yeah, come back next week. It's going to be bigger. And, and, you know, these are kids that have, they, they've, they didn't have the connection between a grocery store and an actual plant growing. They didn't understand, didn't get it, right? So sure enough, he came back the next week and he was like, wow, it got bigger. And, I, and so like, so I had this, this one lonely like cantaloupe growing in, in really crappy soil and yet it was alive and, and thrive, you know, surviving. And so I get just those little moments of teaching, you know, about, you know, because the kids would come by and they would just start whacking at plants with sticks and, you know, just for the heck of it, not really respecting the, you know, and, and yeah, you know, teach, these are teaching moments, we now call them uh, in education. So, 
teaching of the moment is that, you know, oh, this is a living thing. It's alive, like you're alive. You know, you wouldn't like it if I beat you with a stick. You know, this is a, pl a living plant. Don't beat it with a stick, you know, like, and, and so anyway, <laughs> those little things um, and, and uh, you know, I had been exposed to digging for earthworms and, and sort of corralling crayfish in the local creek in Drexel Hill. And so I kind of knew about these things, but these kids growing up where they did, didn't know they'd never seen a, or if they had seen a, a snake or whatever, they're, they would be repulsed by it. Whereas I'm like trying to find friends that have garter snakes so that I can import them to Fitzwater Street, right? And and it's a whole different uh, mindset. So, um, so yeah, I think connecting with those kids, and then and now that we have the guard, the community garden people, and some of our members now have kids who are of just getting to the age where they can help out too, and they can come in on a work day and learn the difference between a weed and a plant. Like, is this a weed or a plant? And I was like, well all plants are you know, all weeds are plants you know that's you have to figure that out first and then decide which ones are the good plants which ones are the less desirable plants and, and sort of make that differentiation and, and even when i've gone some of the phs programs i've done uh around the city have been you know what weed is this what is what is this plant you know what is a weed what what, what is it about it that makes it a weed and you know, educating people about the possible medicinal or, or herbal benefits of things that we consider to be weeds, and then understanding how aggressive they can be or not be. And, um, you know, you mentioned my friend, Stephen, who lives next door, he fell in love with this Ampelopsis porcelain vine. And you spent a lot of money getting getting one from, I don't know, wayside gardens or somewhere for too much money and then you know planted it and I was like I don't know if we should really have that and then as the years go went by we more and more people were recognizing that porcelain vine is an invasive noxious weed it happens to be very beautiful right but but just like barberry and uh other plants that we've that we've grown up with and we've always thought oh these are really sort of function but most mostly their function is to reproduce and spread themselves around and as do, in doing so they become offensive weeds right so uh even in the profession we used to plant a lot of euonymus aleta uh, compacta burning bush and we thought it was a real workhorse plant and only later did we realized that you want them with a burning bush is truly an aggressive weed that we should be removing and not planting, you know, but when I was in school, that was a common thing that you would recommend or plant for people. So it, education never ends. You, you're, you're always learning new things. And as time goes by, you, ha, you know, you realize, well, that wasn't a good idea. We shouldn't have planted that. And so we had to, I finally got Stephen convinced to remove the porcelain vine that we thought was very attractive. And, and uh, I know when you talked with him, we talked about the passion vine. And, uh, you know, that's, again, a, a, a plant that likes really crappy soil and does really well in gravelly, gritty soil. Um, and yet it has a use, uh, it's not, a, it's a really good pollinator plant and it's a really good, um, well, in, in the right weather and season, you can eat the fruits and, uh, you know, so that's, that's a plus. So whereas porcelain vine has so many bad attributes. So yeah, it's sort of like, you know, way the good and the bad with all these plants and decide which is going to be. Yeah, these are the things that you have helped people learn at PHS and helped kids learn um, as they think about beating plants with sticks. Um, 
<laughs> I think that cantaloupe story is going to stick with me for a very long time. But, um, but so I wanted to ask specifically though, because you've mentioned right helping people learn these things with PHS, um, and you mentioned that you yourself um, it took a garden tenders class before, um, and then went on to lead garden tenders classes, right, Sally McCabe. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you? Was that how you first? How did you first get involved? With, how did you first get involved with PHS yourself? Uh, well, the first involvement was with the flat, with the harvest show, and um, and that was probably 1985 or six or something like that. I heard about this event, and I was like, anybody could enter, and um, so I, you know, I went out there um, with uh, cut, mostly cut cut branches and cut flowers and cut herbs and stuff like that. It was basically everything had to be cut, you know, cut and put into a, they have like a thousand mason jars there and you put your stuff in a little mason jar and show it off and, and, you know, and then learning to label them and identify them and, and put them into different categories. They had, and I, it was my first experience, you know, entering, you know, like a farm type show. I had been to Pennsylvania farm show and stuff like that before and other state fairs and I had seen people that had, that had entered you know jams and jellies and whatnot and um and so I I thought well okay I'll I'll try this out and I went with I don't know a dozen entries and um the people were really really uh the volunteers there were just so um friendly, welcoming, outgoing, genteel even, you know, so a lot of these people were experienced growers, but then, you know, I, I was in, and then I, the second year I was entering like every class that I could think of, I was like, oh, I could do this, I could do that, you know, so I was entering a collection of culinary herbs, right, and, I, and you know, I was only, I guess, 26 or 27 something like that and I didn't really understand all the the history or the rules or all these things you know because there's a lot of things that are not written down in the rule in the rules that are just traditionally the way things are done and so I read the description for a tussy mussy I didn't know what that was and this is before we had of course the internet so I was like it was a collection of of uh, attractive flowers arranged formally in a, you know, in a glass jar or whatever. So I show up with this, you know, a bunch of posies stuck into a glass jar. And instead of them, you know, kind of laughing at me or whatever, they said, oh, oh, okay, well, let me show you what the other entries look like and see what you think about that. And so, of course, the other entries looked nothing like what I had, you know, it was supposed to have like a doily and silk stuff, and ribbons and bows and stuff all on it. And that was not what I had any idea what a tussy mussy was. And so it was kind of a learning experience. But, you know, the, I was so impressed with uh, Elise Payne, I think it was, and um, who took me aside and said, rather than just saying, oh, no, that doesn't fit, she would say, oh, well, here, look at what other people have, have submitted for that. And, and, you know, and maybe we can dress this up a little bit or we can, you know, enter into a different class or whatever. There was no, no condescension, no, you know, and I, I, I can imagine from what I've seen of, you know, we've all watched Victorian British shows, even on Downton Abbey, they have a flower show, I think, in one of their episodes where people bring in their roses or whatever it is. And, and you know, and just the, the hoity-toity kind of, you know, condescending attitude that people can, could have. But at PHS, I was just so impressed with the quality of, and then I come to learn later on that these are you know, these are DuPont family people and they're like, oh, there's all, they're all the, these are not all, but, but a 
polite, genteel society people that have, you know, stooped down to judge tomatoes and peppers and whatnot, and, and you know, in a way, and and I'm exaggerating, but I mean that 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 kind of like stuck with me that this this sort of um, personality or or atmosphere of of welcoming that uh, you know I found so impressive with with PHS and so I entered the Harvest Show for a number of years. Eventually, Stephen uh, would go with me to do it because I was just doing it by myself at first, and then and he was like, "Oh, I don't know. I, this sounds like kind of competing. You know, what what's that about?" And, and then of course now um competing has become like his well i wouldn't say competing but participating in the show and and i said you know that the main thing about it is to be a part of it is you're participating yes you're, yes you're getting awards and you're getting ribbons and whatnot but really it's about celebrating this community of people that have uh mutual interest in horticulture and uh, mutual um support group kind of thing so then I, I i joined a couple of plant clubs uh, i had been to meetings of cpos the orchid society and i had been to meetings of the cactus society and so i had joined um the cactus society and um they they had weekly, oh, I'm sorry, monthly meetings. And at every monthly meeting, they have a plant show. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but like they, because there's a, there's a two year cycle because there's so many varieties of cacti and succulents and they all look good at different times of the year. So knowing that they had kind of arranged their, their show schedule. And it's just a, it's just a real, you know, there's a bench up on the side of the room and you put up your plants that you brought in and it's anonymous and you people evaluate them. But again, <clears throat> listening to the way that people would, the invited judges would uh, evaluate each plant, you know, it was always very um, sympathetic or, or up, up you know, writing good comments before you write the bad comments, you know, and so that this kind of attitude about there are no, uh, what Michael Bowl used to say, there are no bad plants, just plants badly used. And, and I always remembered that, the, you know, the plant itself is not bad. It's just, you know, it's the wrong plant in the wrong place, or it's the wrong, it's not, not well taken care of, whatever. Um, so, the, the, the Cactus Club events was really my preparation for entering the flower show because we had these little mini shows every month and we gave out little, you know, 10 cent ribbons. And, um, you know, the, there was very, uh, um, a lot of camaraderie in that group. And, and that group, we always got 50 people at a meeting. It was, it was really, and I, and I was like, well, okay, well, they entered that plan. I guess I can enter mine next time. And I, one at a time, I eventually started entering more plants in the cactus uh, thing and learned their names and whatever. And again, the people and people that, that had any, every right to be, have a better than thou attitude, but they didn't, you know, that was like, oh, that's great that you brought that in blah 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 let's try to let's try to clean it up a little bit let's try to make let's find our the best side of it let's turn it around you know that that kind of, of attitude I, I i've tried to uh assimilate into my own experiences with you know teaching and um you know during try, trying to find the, the the good side of something to stress and then provide a teaching you know, opportunity to, to, you know, share with people. Yeah. So you mentioned there the flower show. So I assume that you got started with that not that long after um, you did your first harvest show in the mid 1980s. Um, right. 
it was a little while. It's still, still the flower show seemed still seemed a bit scary to me. The whole that whole idea, and because I didn't have, uh, you know, one thing about the flower show, it's in at a certain time of the year when it's you know it's difficult to bring in plants. You know, it's it's March, it's winter. There's snow. There's ice. Whatever. And because I had cactus and succulents, a lot of those plants kind of look the same year round you know they don't there are plants that that flower of course but but you know you're looking at structure you're looking at you know and i and i had adopted a lot of plants that i found and people said oh i'm getting rid of these plants do you want them and of course i would, could never say no i you know i should have a never say no award i guess because i, I would always take whatever people would give me and you know people were moving to california whatever they couldn't take their plants with them sure i'll take them whatever and they're miserable looking plants and i would be happy if i could keep them alive and then i didn't really shop for plants per se until later i i realized that a lot of the people that were competing in the flower show were were seeking out good looking plants and i had never really done that i had never really like gone to nurseries looking for the best looking example of whatever euphorbia obesa or something like that and then and then i realized that oh this this could become very expensive but it could all it's also a matter of evaluating a plant uh in a in a container in a greenhouse whatever and deciding okay here's five euphorbias which one is the one that's going to be most show worthy and, and that's the one that I'm going to, you know, maybe pick out. And so uh, up till then, I pretty much, you know, I would take orphan plants and that, you know, I thought it was a challenge to always take an orphan plant and kind of just sustain it. You know, it wouldn't thrive, but it would just still be a lot. At least it wasn't dead, you know, so that was kind of my attitude. As long as it's not dead, it's it, I'm doing a good job. But but, you know, later, later you learn that the judges at the flower show like you know certain things because they're either exotic or rare or or just look really look good in a photograph or whatever so that that's kind of what you start to you know to to lean toward but um and, and a lot of that competing uh with fitzwater 2000 we started saying to the to in the garden you know we could enter as a garden so we that that added rather than me entering my three tomatoes we would enter like as a garden we would enter everybody's you know tomatoes whatever and and we would sort through them and that kind of thing but the thing about the with the harvest show yeah you could grow string beans okay that's fine you could put 10 string beans on a paper plate and enter them but you know, I would wait uh, uh, and I would pick 60 string beans to find the 10 that were the best, the most uniform, the most, all, the most uniform color, the most uniform length. And the same with, with so carrots, I would always wait and pull all my carrots on the same day and then grade them, you know, like this is what people do in in farm shows whatever you you pull 50 carrots and then you decide you have to enter you can enter three you know but they have you want the three that are going to look you know not a skinny one not a fat one but you know three me three medium ones maybe but they have to be identical and that's the judges look for for you know evidence of horticulture means that that they're growing under optimal conditions, you know, and they look really good and that that these three, you know, are are you maybe your three best, but I have I have to pull, like I said, maybe 20 carrots <laughs> to pick out the three that are the most alike, you know, and so that that was kind of a like I said, so as a garden we would enter plants and um you know I would collect stuff from other people and and uh, make it make it you know uh, help to grade them sort through them and grade them and make sure they had the right names on them and things like that and, and then enter them 
as as a community garden. So we ended up getting awards, you know, as as a garden, and that helped to build. So in our we have plots, individual plots. People can grow whatever they want in their plot. You know, we don't manage that um, as long as it doesn't impose on other people's plots. So some people that really like Italian food, they might grow a lot of pest, a lot of basil, a lot of tomatoes and hot peppers and stuff like that. Somebody else is growing root crops, you know, radishes and beets and rutabagas. And depending on what your ethnic background might be, you like to grow certain things. Or, or you like to eat certain things, basically, and so that's what you grow. And uh, you know, uh, again, um, over time, you start to buy seed varieties that you think are going to look good in the show. Maybe not. You're not necessarily growing them for their taste, but for their, you know, because they're super speckly or because they're super green or they're they're really fat or they're, you know, you have you just you go through the seed catalogs. It's like a you know. In the winter time, we love to go through seed catalogs and pick out things that are really cool that strike you for some reason, and try them out. You know, so uh, that, that's a way to, um, you know, provide variety on the palate, you know, or when, when you're or when you're serving stuff on a plate. But you're you're you know, or you can preserve things. And I would I love my raspberries. I because of the way but they. They, when they fruit, you know, it's not October, it's, you know, it's May, so I have to do something with them. So I can them and make raspberry jelly, raspberry syrup, raspberry sauce. You know, I had a, we had a peach tree for many years, and so I would can peaches and the peach tree. All the, all the fruits would ripen within four days, so I'd end up with 120 peaches. And then what do you do? I mean, you can only eat, make so much pie. I'm not really a pastry chef. So I would just can the peaches and then I figured I could use them later. So if I wanted to make pie later, I could do that. But right, right, right that moment, I had to get rid of 120 peaches somehow, you know, and it's like when people grow zucchini, they have the same problem that all the zucchinis tend to be ripening at the same time. And People are scrambling to give away their zucchini because you can only eat, well, most people can only tolerate so many zucchinis in a, in a row. You know, after, after a week of zucchini, you're like, okay, now what can I do? Zucchini bread, zucchini slaws, you know, there's, a, you know, so you, that's, that's one of the, the good downsides to growing vegetables is that you end up you know having an abundance of things to share with other people and so and we do that same thing you know some Kathy will say oh I got extra string beans I I you know I more came up than I thought were going to happen do you want some and the same thing we would we would trade with each other or just you know give us give each other stuff and when we had older uh, some of the older people we had in the neighborhood initially um, that supported our efforts and signed the petitions to protect the property, but they, you know, so we would re reward them by leaving them a little, you know, a shopping bag of, you know, here's some stuff from the garden for you to enjoy. And, it'd be, and they'd be delighted to have a fresh tomato and, you know, things that, you know, cause you know, you can't buy them in the store. You, you, you buy a, you have a nice fresh, beefsteak tomato and, and, and some uh, whatever it was, herbs and the different things. And we would share them among, especially among the older people in the neighborhood who, who didn't have the opportunity to, to garden uh, or weren't able to garden anymore. Um, so they, you know, they always uh, appreciated getting fresh produce uh, from the garden. So that's Another way to sort of build community, I think, by just, you know, unexpected surprises like that can, can we have some people on the, our block are really good <clears throat> cooks or chef or, or uh, pastry chefs. And so they, they'll make, you know, delicious cookies and things like that, that I wouldn't know how to, how to do, but they, they can turn something into a, you know, a real treat. 
by by and then shared that with the other people in the garden and so it was just sort of an informal no it's just very informal but we would swap with each other and stuff like that and so that's kind of kind of fun to do you have pastry chefs to put some of those 120 peaches to good use well yeah <laughs> that that tree is gone now so that's not a possibility but um the the uh yeah i i could have if they but people people come and go from the neighborhood so we've had We've had people, a couple of the original members, you know, were in their 80s, 90s even. And um, so when, uh, and we had made adjustments like to the watering station so that she could reach the, reach the water because it was, you know, uh, too low on the ground to crouch down and whatever. And so, um, Bernice uh, was her name, and so she we erect made a special watering thing for to to help her get the watering done, and um, she uh, passed on. But but and then other people have moved into the neighborhood as the neighborhood has improved over time. I I know Stephen talked about you know back in the eighties and nineties and how. Uh, forlorn this area was but now we have younger families moving in with them comes <clears throat> new energy um younger people in the garden we've we're trying to get <clears throat> a couple of those younger people to uh <clears throat> take up the gardening skills and just learn how to weed and how to do these things mostly it's their parents doing it not themselves but at least it's hopefully the potential is there yeah um and so you've been working on uh the garden since the 90s as you mentioned um and you played a lot of roles in it including helping with the design um helping coordinate people getting together for the flower show helping uh i mean sharing food with other gardeners et cetera. Et cetera. um I want to at this point turn to something else that you're professionally known for, which is that you coordinate the Temple University exhibit at the Flower Show um, as well, right? And also, speaking of teaching um, and teaching, um, you know, the younger generation at the Garden, you, that you, your relationship with Temple is that you're a professor there, right? Um, yes. yes. So I wanted to ask, um, how did you get started? working with Temple on their flower show exhibit? Um, well, initially I was hired there to teach engine, landscape engineering. <clears throat> and, um, and then I kind of, you know, I had always been to the flower, I'd been going to the flower show since I was 10, 10 years old maybe, or something like that. I mean, I've been involved, you know, going to the show at the convention center um for many off not every year but off and on <clears throat> over the years with my parents and stuff like that so i knew about it and then um at the uh at temples somehow there had been a it was like faculty would do the flower show for maybe two years in a row or maybe three at the most and then they would move on and someone else would do it. And it was something that the school was committed to doing or had experience doing, but um, there had not been a, a long-term um, person there. And, you know, I was, I'm an adjunct, I was an adjunct there for most of my time there. And so adjuncts are sort of like, uh, will call, you know, employees so you're not really part of the full staff but i really because i had been involved with entering plants in the flower show in the past and i had helped a couple people uh, i had helped very minimally michael bowl with his exhibit before and with uh some other the plant societies that were helping with one of one or two of their exhibits and so I had I knew my way around the the show a little bit, and um, 
knew some of the players. Um, but once I dove into the, uh, the, the show, I guess, I guess they noticed, or I noticed that, that I was enjoying it a lot. And I, I like the, not everybody is able to work under pressure, under a time-led deadline, uh, you know, and not everybody has the those practical skills. So although I was uh, excelled in school as a designer, you know, as a, not a builder, but a des like a designer who never got his hands dirty, you know, my hands would be dirty from graphite, but not from digging holes or whatever, but um, I, I had over the years developed uh, an interest in, like I said, in getting stuff built, you know, getting thing, being able to draw something and then have it built, you know, and I was frustrated at my previous firm that it took 10 years and I would finally be able to go to something that, that I had designed that was built 10 years later and walk through it. And I was like, wow, this is, this is the one I drew. This is what, how lines on paper become real, right? And so seeing that is really a, a it's a rare treat for, because a lot of people work at a firm for two or three years and then they move on and they don't actually see their work finished. So anyway, I, I um, got into doing the flower show the first year um, on, we were doing a uh, Italian Renaissance theme and I thought, well, this is kind of cool, you know, and, but I thought, well, there's also things that I could add to this to make it a little bit more, you know, make it more, uh, it's the little, it's the little touches that, that really make a, a, a good exhibit become a great exhibit. And so like in that show, I, I, I brought in a bunch of, uh, bottle wine, bottle corks and, um, added little touches like that to, to make the place look less sterile. And I don't know what, but people hadn't thought about that before, but I had been to the show so many times and for so many years that I had seen other exhibits and looked, I, you know, I'm the kind of person I would go to the, I don't go to the flower show for two hours. I go there for like the day. So I'm there at 10 o'clock when they open and much to my parents' chagrin, I wouldn't want to leave. You know, it'd be five o'clock, six o'clock. I'd be like, I'm not done yet. I haven't seen everything yet. And so uh, I would go. And when I went with Stephen, um, the same thing. We would go at 10 o'clock when the doors open and we'd be there until eight o'clock at night. And seeing, I'd be making notes, writing down everything that I saw, taking, you know, drawing sketches. I didn't, we didn't have photography as much then, but, you know, I wouldn't want to leave. So uh, that kind of attention to detail, I think, is what they, they saw or the people at Temple saw and they were like, oh, okay, this, this is, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I, so over the years, I <clears throat> went under the wings of other people that came before me. And then, you know, got to the point where I guess they uh, worked. We had a mutual commitment to one another. And then, you know, like I said, it's always hard as an adjunct to, to be that invested in something, but, but I was doing it more for the, um, I guess for the interaction with the, I mean, I, I think I'm a, my, both of my parents are school teachers. I'm, I've came just teaching later than they did, but I would always, even the firm that I was at before, I was always teaching the younger hires. This is how we do things. This is how, this is a better way to do it, a faster way to do it, an easier way to do it. You know, I have the experience. So I, and I would just share that with people as, as when I went to, the harvest show people were so willing to share and to you know that this kind of sharing thing is uh, i think it's kind of unique um or at least in in the times we're living in now so few people are sharing it's all about how much money can i can i make or how much 
you know, what, what, what kind of compensation can I get for doing this? And I don't, I don't know, I've never really had that gene in me. So it's, it's more like about what can I give back or give, or, you know, so uh, it, it, it satisfied needs for me. And I think I was satisfying needs for them. And so, and Temple has been in, in the flower show for decades. I mean, this is not like a, you know, and, and other schools have as well. There's other, um, you know, like Saul High School and Lincoln High School. And I was always admiring the work that students were doing and at, when I would go to the show and want to see their exhibits and whatnot. And, and now it's at the point where, I mean, hearsay, uh, I, I have pretty good hearing and I, I hear almost everything that people say. Um, and and it, yeah, and so when I, I hear people saying, well, where's the temple exhibit? I want to see the temple exhibit. And I'm like, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear that when people show up and the first thing that they, um, you know, I, and I've done out lots of jobs at the flower show as, volunteer, as a volunteer. I've helped wrangle the buses uh, and the bus operators, whatever. And, and, and I've done question and answer booths and stuff like that at the flower show too. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, but I'm always delighted when I hear people say, well, where, where are the academic exhibits? Where, where's the school? Where's, where's that temple exhibit? They always have a great exhibit. And, you know, I hear the people say that and I'm thinking, why, what, why do they want to see the temple exhibit? You know, and, and they want to see it for uh, a number of reasons, but um, I, I try to make it so that it, it becomes a destination uh, that people want to go to. And, and so, and I can't do that, of course, without all the students and the faculty and other people that are <clears throat> involved in that. But, you know, my job, my job there, I see as being a more of a, a conductor uh, or a, a facilitator, a manager, you know, a, a wrangler of, of unruly students or people that are students that are unfocused but you know they're they're coming and a lot of them are coming as as um eager to learn they're they're blank slates in a way but they're eager to learn and they're eager to make their imprint in the world and so we want their imprint to be about environmental responsibility and about the common good and all those things that PHS has as part of its own mission, right, is to, to connecting people through horticulture and, and we're doing the same thing uh, at Temple, only we're providing this design, um, editing or, or improvement uh, aspect of it, because aesthetics is such a big part of it. And when I was talking about like just making your community garden look good through all, all four seasons, I'm aware that aesthetics is a big part of how people perceive their neighborhoods, their their world, right? And and uh, you know, I'm I'm uh, you can do things that are functional, sure, <clears throat> but can you do it in a way that makes it attractive and a place that you where you want to spend time? a place that you want to go back to again and again. Those are kind of the, <clears throat> the things that make a, a, an ordinary place stand out and become extraordinary, I think, so. You've gone full circle for, for being inducted into the world of plants, um, picking those raspberries, to teaching your student, to helping your students realize their own ambitions and creating beautiful and folk, beautiful spaces at the flower show as well. Um, it sounds like to me. Yeah, and I think that, you know, and, and just to stay on that, the temple, uh, uh, there are schools of landscape architecture throughout the country. I went to Penn State, for example, and there's schools in Iowa and Nebraska and Kansas, everybody's got, you know, but Temple's <clears throat> one of the very, very few schools, one of maybe two or three in the entire country 
that has a, a uh, build component as part of its design curriculum. So we provide that. Um, and I've heard that there are some students when they're shopping around to find the right school to go to, and they hear about our flower show and our design build experience, they're drawn to that compared to other schools and it, it can be a deciding factor in them wanting to go to Temple, which being a state school is more affordable than say Penn or some other schools, but it's, it's also provides them with, you know, this bridge that I was looking for too, between uh, design and construction or between design and, or, you know, architectural design and, and uh, horticulture and working with plants. And so we, we also, aside from that distinction, we also <clears throat> grow and force our own plants for the flower show. So a lot of people will buy plants, you know, they'll buy a truckload of palm trees or whatever from Florida and they bring them up here. And, you know, the, the day of the show, they're putting those things into their exhibit. Whereas we're, because we have a horticulture component um, at our school, we have our own greenhouse and whatnot. So we, we have the facilities there to also, if people wanna take a, a, an emphasis on horticulture or if they wanna major in horticulture, they can do that. And so they're the people that I have to thank because they're the ones who are making our plants look good for the show and the fact that students are doing it, we're not just buying it from some nursery in California or whatever, we're, we're actually nurturing these plants on campus before they get loaded into the truck to go to uh, the convention center. So that, that's a really good uh, amount of, of connection, but it's also a, a huge source of stress for me. And, and like I said, I. Uh, not every professor wants to live under that kind of stress, um, but I like it. I, I, I thrive on it. And, you know, the thing is we're spending all this prep time for 10, for a 10 day show. And, you know, it's so sad at the end when it's all taken down, but um, a lot of students, I think later on when, they, when I see them, years later on Facebook or wherever they're posting stuff and they'll, they'll say that it was what the, the highlight or one of the highlights of their career at Temple was being involved in the flower show. And so I, I think we, we engender or, or try to engender that, that kind of, you know, um, good feelings and, 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 you know, it's hard, the work is hard, you know, and, and it's, it's not, easy and there's no one you don't get an A just because you showed up for the you know for class I mean there it's and and even even when when we get a gold medal or a silver medal or a trophy or whatever it doesn't guarantee every student gets an A you know but but it's the experience of doing it and building it working together with it as a team and you know all that kind of team uh, cooperation negotiation you know some people end up they they're crying and they're they're overstressed and they're whatever but at the end of the day they can step back and look at something that they built you know and sort of and say wow you know i'm just not just drawing lines on paper i'm actually i'm seeing the it come to life you know and that's uh, uh, like a an unforgettable i didn't have that experience in school i I actually, at Penn State, I did design one exhibit for Penn State. It was extremely primitive now that I look back at it, but you know, they needed somebody to design uh, a little area. Um, and this was 1978 or nine. And they asked me to do this mural or whatever. And I did that and I, I it was in the flower show and I didn't, had no idea that 30 years later, I'd be doing so much more of this. But um, anyway, it's a, it's a, 
it's a good way to, to give back and to, I guess, also, you know, through the, the reason the school is doing it is to let people know about what is landscape architecture? What, what is environmental science? What are all these things? What, what do these mean for real, real life people? It's not like going to the car show, um, which is spectacular, but it's, it's, it's a different kind of a message, a different kind of a thing. And we hope that people will take home ideas from they, that they see at the show, either a favorite plant or a, a, a trick or a skill or a, or a way to repurpose a, a storm window into a greenhouse or whatever, they're taking home some little tidbit um, that they can hopefully put to use, you know, when they go back to Springfield or Aston or, or South Jersey, wherever they live and, and, you know, put it, you know, be inspired by that. So that's kind of, the goal. So you're giving your students both valuable practical experience and also satisfying all those people you hear asking where the temple exhibit is. <laughs> well, um, well, yeah. Yeah. And and also when they're when they find the exhibit and they come, you know, they've gone come on a bus from Percasy or wherever they've, you know, or Birdsboro, and then they they go they go to the show and then you know I eavesdrop also um, uh, at the show, I'll follow around anonymously behind people just to hear what what catches their eye. And we actually ask our students to volunteer a couple shifts at the show to do the same thing, to sort of eavesdrop on what people are saying, what they're taking pictures of, what what are what are the and you know to hear them say, oh, that's really cool. Look what they did with that, you know, that old. Uh, ho or, or look look how they rearranged this you know what this stream thing uh into something like really really cool and and so we're you know getting that feedback even that informal feedback is as valuable to me as the you know the gold trophy thing that that we might get as well for the trophy case but hearing people that you're connecting with people um in even the smallest ways. Uh, that's because that's how that's how I when I visited the show in the 1970s, you know, and I would see these exhibits of the pine lands and wonderful recreations of natural environments. And I'd be like, wow, that's that's really cool. And I never, you know, I, I would come home from the show with like five pages of notes, you know, of things that I had uh, taken uh, notice of at the show. So uh, I think that's trying to, you know, the show has been going on for a long time, as, as I'm sure you're aware. And so the challenge is to make it fresh and new every year. That's not easy, but, but that's why people go to the, to the show. Wine corks, hose, and storm windows, you, you, you seem to be managing. <laughs> but, um, Michael, there is so much more that I'd love to ask you about. Um, but I know also that we unfortunately have limited time. Um, and, uh, and also, I'm most curious to hear, I think, about your current and future aspirations at this moment, given that you've shared so many wonderful stories already about your different experiences in the past with It's Water 2000 and with uh, The Flower Show. Um, so I may, um, what are your future aspirations um, for Fitzwater 2000? And all, and in a related note, um, what can you give any, uh, I don't know, any hints or anything that you're, you're able to share about um, the upcoming exhibit for Temple at the Flower Show this year. Um, well, the first question, I guess, the the you know the protection of the garden now through NGT is is crucial, and um, that we have this permanence about it. Um, I know that there are people that that uh, have located to the block because 
of the fact that we have the, not just our block, but that within the neighborhood, there are a number of attractive, uh, inviting open spaces that, that add to the, the vitality of this area. Um, and that would include st street trees and the other things that have grown out of this effort, you know. Um, and so people want to live here. They want to locate here. And unfortunately, my property values are rising rap more rapidly than I would hope. Um, but um, that's the price of, of popularity, I guess. Um, but people are investing <clears throat> in, uh, you know, in the neighborhood and in the community. So that's, that's really a good, a good thing. They want to live here for whatever combination of reasons there is. Um, and that's something that we didn't really foresee or didn't really anticipate to the extent that it's been. Um, and um, so I think that, and, and as new people arrive and and you know we we just hope that and through ngt's involvement we'll be assured that it'll remain a, a chemical free space a, a place where pollinators uh, uh can thrive and 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 continue um that's not accidental you know we have ngt and, and our garden itself has very strong rules about uh, chemical uh, treatments for diseases and pests and things like that. You know, we don't tolerate those things. And, and so that, that's part of education. You know, there are people that think that bee, all bees are bad. And we have to say, no, actually, these are honeybees. They're not going to sting you. You know, that's, that's an educational opportunity there to let people learn about these things. Um, but um to the second question the you know the theme for the flower show is the garden electric this year um because of uh of the transition back indoors it's going to provide some familiarity for for me um at least with the operations of the convention center and which which are which are challenging um, but the, um, I think a while the outdoor show has been uh, a real boon to um, things to do in the summertime, it, there's nothing that can replace the idea of coming in from a snowstorm in March and coming indoors and seeing smelling feeling you know all the the humidity the orchids the all the fantastic things that draw people to to drive from buffalo new york to come down for the day to visit our show you know it's not just for the people that live i can walk to the flower show from my house you know but most people are or many many people are coming by the bus loads you know from other places and to get a, a touch of spring at a time of year when it's so dreary and and you know cloudy and overcast outside, so that that that's I think um, a real draw for people. And the yeah, you know, we've wrestled with this theme, the garden electric. You know, I I don't know. I I imagine we're going to see some some garden train sets. I imagine we're going to see you know, spinning windmills and whatnot. I, I don't know um, what we're gonna see, but I mean, at Temple, we, uh, we are committed to um, environmental awareness and, and try to make it, keep it as local as possible. So we, and we, and I, I in particular, and <clears throat> my colleague Rob that I've taught with for the last dozen years, we're very big on uh, providing depth and um, 
density to our exhibit. So there, there's a lot of, uh, there's subtlety as well, but we, you know, when we did exhibit on uh, the power of water, the wonders of water, or whatever it was called, you know, we dove into the Schuylkill uh, canal system and, and learned about history of canals and how they're part of the landscape and really like played on that and provided a lot of depth in that specific like direction. We could have picked, we could have just done a big waterfall and shooting jets of cascading whatever, but that's not what we do. We, so we are not going to do it an outdoor train set and we're not going to have, you know, a bunch of Rube Goldberg uh, electrical devices. So I can tell you that, but aside from that, you're going to have to come and see for yourself. But we're, we're, our, our, our theme is pretty much to uh, consider the obsolescence of electrical devices. Like, you know, when you, when you look at the news and see like what's happening in, in U Ukraine and other places where or China where, where um, electrical infrastructure is so critical to uh, survival and yet there's also like sustainability issues related to that and and a lot of things that we design and build are, are obsolete in 50 years you know um, are we going to still see uh, big transmission towers all, all around the landscape in the future? Are they gonna all be replaced by solar power? I don't know. I mean, but we're, we're tackling some of those issues and ha what happens when you abandon a power plant or a, a transmission tower or whatever and, and give it back to nature um, and as, as it's reclaimed by, by nature, by wild plants that might grow up onto these towers or, or grow onto abandoned relics of, you know, we have power plants on the Delaware River that have sat vacant for 30 years. And, you know, only now, and, you know, I think they've had concerts there. They've had the X Games there. They've had uh, uh, other things, installations there, but they, they, we have all these relics of old power electrical things you know it's it, we all kind of want the the next bright shiny new thing you know but uh what about all the old stuff that's still here what we're we gonna do we do we tear it down do we respect it do we incorporate it what that is so we're a lot of my um direction in the flower show is not to tell people what to do but to ask questions and let them decide for themselves. So we'll be doing the same thing this year. Like um, we, we don't, we, we try not to have a lot of don't do this, do that kind of thing more. It's more like, why are you doing this? Why are we doing that? Do we need to have lawns? You know, can, can we have an attractive space without having lawns? That was one of our big things a couple of years ago. Like, just posing the questions and letting people decide for themselves or uh, coaxing them along to decide for themselves, is there a better way to do this that's more respectful of the environment and water quality and air quality and all of these things and aesthetics at the same time. So there's all this environmentalism can be very focused on protecting resources, but without any kind of eye to aesthetics you know i go out here on jfk boulevard i see all these bike lanes now and i i uh, you know it's great that they have all these bike lanes but all i see is plastic pylons everywhere and i'm thinking to myself there's got to be a better aesthetic way to do this and still achieve the same goal so aesthetics is very very important and and we can't uh, just solve everything with traffic paint and pylons in the middle of the roadway. Like, <laughs> there's, let's make it beautiful somehow. You know, we, you know, the the parkway is a beautiful thing. The 
The parks that we have in the city are beautiful. We have beautiful gardens. You know, there's an aesthetic component that should and has to be part of our outdoor environment, not just a functional thing. So yeah, I'm asking questions, <laughs> always asking questions and letting people try to come up with their own creative answers to those questions. So I'm sure yeah. more than more than I should have. <laughs> Well, it sounds to me like on the one hand, you uh, you at Fitzwater 2000 um, have been working with the Neighborhoods Garden Trust to preserve kind of a welcoming space, as you say, a beautiful space that helps people, that attracts people to the neighborhood, and makes them feel um, like it's a nice place to live in. And then similarly, you're at, you and Rob Cooper and your students at Temple are working in this year's flower show. Um, to make an exhibit that asks questions about similar questions about preservation and what to do and and sustainability and also how to make um exit infrastructure or dilapidated infrastructure as well kind of uh into those welcoming spaces similarly so it seems to me like there are a lot of parallels between um between the two hats you're wearing that we both we talked about in this interview. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, well, one, one correction is that, um, so Rob Cooper, I've been working with Rob for, I guess, a dozen years. Uh, um, Rob's on sabbatical this year, so I'm um, fortunate to have one of my better, best, better uh, former students, Zoe Booth Jarrett, um, is adjuncting with me on this year's show. So Rob's not uh, involved this particular year, but hopefully he'll be, um, he's not far, he's, he's not far away. Uh, he's, I have him on speed dial a couple times a week. So, but, but um, Zoe and I, uh, Zoe is one of my former students and um, really excelled in a previous flower show exhibit that his class built. Um, several years ago uh, called um, Temenens Tract and uh, we're so we're working together really well and we have uh, what I've what I have noticed which is really rewarding to me is that he has absorbed or uh, or I helped cultivate maybe some of those values that I just talked about um, in him. So as one of my former students, I'm, I'm proud to see that uh, even though that was maybe what, 10 years ago or so that, that he's, you know, he, uh, I, don't, I don't like to say that I'm making carbon copies of myself, but, but, but the, the idea is that he has the same curiosity, the same kind of uh, fascination and a sense of environmental responsibility that we have taught at school and he's been receptive to that and I, I see a lot of me in him as I hope to see in many of other students you know at least a little bit I don't want them all to be but that they should be free thinkers but um, I see a lot of what he learned uh, in school is evidenced by now with him teaching with me side by side. So that's really a, a good thing. So. Yeah, your questions have sparked questions in your students. And yeah, it's, it must, it sounds like a really good experience to be teaching alongside someone who can demonstrate to you um, what they've learned. And it's yep. pretty appreciative. But yep. yep. And, and as a member of a younger generation, he has, as all younger people do, he's a lot, it's a lot of things that come easier, easier to him than they do to me because, you know, of all the technology and whatnot. And, and uh, you know, and, and yet they're, they're grounded in these values. That, that's the important thing. Technology can change, you know, the, the tools can change, but if the values are there, that include environmental responsibility, you know, awareness of, of the impact on the world, of the carbon footprint, all these kind of 
there's all kinds of lingo that goes with that stuff. But basically, it's it's loving the land that we're that we've inherited and and respecting it and making it better. That's kind of the real thing. And and as as PHS would say, for for the greater good, you know. And so we that that's always been before PHS. You know, I don't know if they think they invented that phrase, but they didn't. I mean, I, I, I've heard that phrase throughout my life and, you know, doing things for the greater good and not for not for monetary compensation, not for maybe for a pat slap on the back that says good job, you know, but it's mostly about you doing it because it matters and because it's our legacy. Uh, to we only have one planet. I know people are trying to go to Mars, but we really only have this one this one planet, and uh, and we need to, you know, embrace it and and keep it going. So, yeah, I, I think that that's something that a lot of gardeners can get behind that you just articulated there, and I I know that I I that I think that you know. I think it logs similar lines and I appreciate uh, that statement. So I think it's a great note to end the interview on. We have one planet and we need to, and we need to do what we can to keep it going and make it a good place to live. Um, so I want to thank you again so much, Michael, for sitting down to talk to me about all this stuff today um, and sharing your many incredible stories and your landscape architecture and gardening and naturalist wisdom with me. Um, I'm going to turn off the recording now.